amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. And Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. And Christ is risen from the grave. Prodigal is welcome home, the sinner now a saint. For the God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Sing this out with us. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? For the mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise his name forever. sweet embrace I see your scars your open arms the beauty of your face through tears of joy I'll leave my voice in everlasting praise hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave you know this part oh death where is your sin Oh, fear, where is your power for the mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed, eternal. on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace i'll see your scars your open arms the beauty of your face through tears of joy i'll leave my voice in everlasting praise hallelujah and christ is risen from the grave So I'll throw up my hands and praise you again and again. For all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. 
How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. Every song must sing, and you never do. So I'll throw on my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king. Set for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response, I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. Sing it out, church. So I'll throw on my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I'm nothing else. Except for a heart singing Hallelujah, Hallelujah. So come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of the slums. Get up and praise the Lord. Yeah, sing it out this morning. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of the slums. Up and praise the Lord. Come on, church, sing it. And come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of the songs. Get up and praise the Lord. So I'll throw up. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Father, we just thank you so much, Lord. What do we have to offer a king except for our gratitude, our arms stretched wide, Lord, praising you and blessing your name, Lord. Pray, God, that you would just... Um, Continue to be with the service, Lord. Be with Pastor Larry as he brings forth the word. Lord, give him strength and boldness, Lord, in these last days, Lord, as he proclaims your word. Father, I pray that you would uh, just bless those that are away from us, the Azamas and 
pray, God, that you would bring them back to us next week rejuvenated and pray, God, that you would be with everything that's going on in the church, Lord. Pray, God, that you would just um, have your hand in everything that we do, the ladies' Bible study, the men's study. God, just I pray that we would come together as a body of Christ, Lord, and lift you up. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more from heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I
yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. God, it is so good to be in your house to worship this morning. Father, I just pray that as you've delivered us into this place, I hope and pray that every lip in this room can confess that you are the Savior in their life, that you have paid their debt, that you have set them free from the bondage of sin. But Lord, today, if there is someone here that still is uncertain of that truth in their life, if they can't stand this morning and say, I know Jesus, I just pray that this day, this very moment, that they would have your spirit come into their life that your spirit would begin to, to mend the soil of their hearts so that that great seed that can produce fruit for you can endure through all things. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you do for us. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys, for a time of worship. They did a good job in the Azamas stead, didn't they? And uh, I know the Azamas, they'd be proud of you guys. You did a great job today. Appreciate that. And... Uh, uh, we're going to continue our series and uh, talking about the parables of Jesus. And if you would like to, turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to go a little bit further uh, this week than we did last week, of course. And we're going to talk about the parable of the wheat and the tares. And, you know, as you turn there, of course, if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in front of you in the pews. Um, I'm going to have them up on the screen as well, so you can follow along up there. But as I mentioned last week, that a parable is the way that Jesus chose to teach by sharing an earthly truth, um, and then he would throw a spiritual truth alongside of the earthly truth. And it helps to keep this in mind when reading the parables of Jesus, that man is made in the image of God. Okay, Keep that in mind when you're reading the parables of Christ. Keep in mind that we men, women, we are... We are made in the image of God and that there is a God-ordained connection between the human and the, the, the divine. And so keep that in mind as you read the parables and today as we go through this because the strength of Christ's parables are in the very real connection between the creator and his creation. Um, and that's why Jesus can take the physical things and he can make a connection to the higher spiritual things. And now... I'd like to just take just a moment to mention the phrase, real quick, the kingdom of heaven. I didn't touch on this last week, but I want us to kind of maybe get an understanding of this before we get into the, the meat of the parable, because at first glance, the phrase, the kingdom of heaven, might seem to mean the kingdom of, of God up in heaven. Um, in fact, the, this phrase is used about 30, a little over 30 times in the book of Matthew, um, it's interchangeable with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ. Okay, so there's a lot of views now on what these phrases mean, and they can really confuse folks. And I think that we can get a pretty accurate idea of what God means in Scripture when he used the phrase kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, kingdom of Christ, when Paul, he summarized the reason for us why we don't let squabbles over food and drink divide the body of Christ. Uh, if we look at Romans chapter 14, verse 17, we read these words. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But what is it? It's righteousness, it's peace, it's joy in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And so the kingdom of heaven is not necessarily being spoken of here, of the, of the kingdom of, of glory that, rem, that you know, reigns in heaven uh, now and that, that will one day be the kingdom that rules and reigns everywhere and at the, uh, the, you know, for all time at the, the, the return of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven has to do specifically, now hear this, wherever the gospel is preached, wherever it is accepted and it takes root and it grows and it flourishes, uh, first within the heart of every individual person and then within a community of believers that would inevitably follow, which we, we call the church. And so the kingdom of heaven is within us. It's, it's what's going on in us. It's the growth of, of God's word in us. And, and so we see this initially in the parable that Jesus began with. We went over it last week, the parable of the seed and the soils. If you remember the three types of soils, 
the three types of heart soil, if you will, where the seed didn't take root, um, it, didn't, it didn't grow well, um, it did not become fruit-bearing, um, and, and this is where the kingdom of heaven does not reign. It does not reign in those types of hearts, those, those types of heart soils. This is not to say uh, that the spiritual laws of the kingdom of God, that kingdom, don't apply. Jesus' parables, and, and he, thank God he explains some of them to folks, right? They demonstrate clearly that the laws of the kingdom, they're always going on. They're always in force. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, it, it's that only where there is a heart or a collection of hearts that have been given over to Jesus Christ, that have surrendered their life to God through his son Christ, and where the Holy Spirit is working, where you will have regular members of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so in this parable today, we see another example of this. And it's really interesting. That, you know, you can read a parable as a Christian for 20 and 30 years. Um, you can read the scriptures, and then one day you'll read it again, and, and God just speaks to you about some things in it in different ways. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, we have seed that is being sown. Okay, it's another picture of an agricultural, like a farmer, seed is being sown. This time, we have a good man and we have an evil man. Both of them are sowing seeds in the field. Both types of seed bear fruit. They bear grain. Um, one to righteousness and then one to unrighteousness or and hypocrisy. And so that's what we'll see here. So let's read this parable, Matthew 13, 24 to 30. And then we're going to read the explanation that Jesus gives uh, in the following scriptures, 37 to 43. There's, there's a parable in between this section of parables, but we're gonna, we'll probably discuss that at a later time. And so looking at verse 24, this is where he starts. He said, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder, they came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Why does it have tares in the field now? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go out and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you also root also the wheat with them. He said, Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, now let's, we're going to skip down. Here's the explanation, okay? Jesus gives the explanation, starting in verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field, it's the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them, the evil one, the wicked one, and he says, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Verse 41. <clears throat> the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. 43, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now when we read who hath ears to hear, we're not talking about corn. <laughs> I know we're talking about farming right now, but that's not what we're talking about there. If we have ears to hear, we need to hear what's going on, right? And so um, let's do this. One of the first things that I found interesting, I'm just going to point out a bunch of things about these, these sections of Scripture um, that I think will help us gain some understanding and maybe apply it to our lives today as believers. One of the first things I found very interesting with this, is the workers in this parable are the reapers at the, at the time of the harvest, and they're the angels. 
At the time of the harvest, these are the, the ones that are going to do the reaping. They're angels. And I found it interesting also that they will be involved in the separating of the non-believers from the believers on the day of judgment. And what I also notice is that the workers, the master servants who are there every day working in the field, those, they're not actually identified in the parable. Now most, most everyone assumes that those of us who are disciples of Jesus that are serving him, maybe by using our gifts, our spiritual gifts, in whatever way he has planted us or placed us, but especially within the body of Christ, that those of us that are those Christians, they are the workers since that is one of the ways that Jesus uses the term when he's speaking of his kingdom. If you guys remember in Matthew chapter 9, remember when Jesus said, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few? And then he said, therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. And right after that, what does Jesus do? He commissioned and he sent out the 12. Okay? And so that's a very popular opinion and belief there. It's the one that I hold to as well. Um, but let's dig a little bit deeper into this parable. Jesus is once again, he is the one sowing the seed, the good seed. And what is the field? The world. The world is the field. And if you remember last week, the seed being sown was the word of the kingdom, the gospel. That was the seed that was being sown in our last parable. This time, though, because I don't want us to get confused by this, um, what does Jesus say that the seed is in verse 38? What does he say there? So this time the seeds sown are either those who belong to the kingdom, uh, one kingdom or the other, okay? So the seed being sown is either children of the kingdom or they are children of the wicked one. Those are the two seeds that are being sown. So we're not talking about sowing the gospel here. This is sowing the seed. This is children of, of, the, the, of, uh, of God or they are children of the wicked one. So... Uh, I've heard, now listen, I've heard a lot of explanations about this, um, this scripture with the seed being sown as still being the word of God or the gospel, and uh, then, you know, people would kind of go down a path, a trail uh, about how Satan sows false doctrine within the true doctrines of the kingdom and how we have to be students of the word so that we can discern the truth and not allow those things to take root in our churches and in our hearts and all of that. And as solid as that is and as sound and as true as those principles are, that's not what this parable has to do with. And here's where the danger lies. When we are only allowed to teach and to preach what the Bible teaches when the Bible teaches it. Okay, otherwise we're teaching falsehood, we're getting people to believe something that is not completely true, and false doctrine can be sown with that kind of seed. So I have, uh, I've read many different uh, opinions or commentaries and studies and, and, um, that say that you know, what we see in this parable and Jesus' explanation of it uh, is that the kingdom of heaven now is the church of Jesus Christ on earth. And they say that, you know, that is what he's talking about here. The problem that I have with this is that Jesus has already told us that the field is the world. The field's the world. He doesn't actually mention the church specifically there. And the, the other problem is that if, if this is the way that people are understanding this parable, what happens is it sets people up to go away from what Jesus himself says that he's teaching about. He gives the explanation. And, and on top of that, unfortunately, it also sets us up to get even further away when we look at the next two parables down the line. That's why I feel like it's so important that I share this with you so we get an understanding of this, okay? So again, Jesus' own explanation. He's speaking of believers, and he's speaking of unbelievers living side by side in the world. Children of the kingdom, children of the wicked one, one sown by Jesus, the other sown by the devil. Okay, so you get that picture in your mind. Now we're going to go to uh, look at this process that Jesus describes it, how he describes it here, the wheat and the tares. Okay, so you think about wheat and tares. What are these things? Um, they're two plants. Believe it or not, they look very, very similar. The wheat and the tares look very similar. Um, we're all familiar with wheat, right? You ever, anybody drive by, you know, see a wheat field, you know? Um, we're all kind of uh, familiar with this. In Palestine, there is a plant called the darnel that looks just like both wheat and rye. 
um, especially in the beginning stages of its growth. You couldn't even really tell the difference. Now, the difference between the two, it doesn't become obvious until the wheat begins to actually form grains, or guess what? Produce fruit. That's when you can tell the difference between the two. Because one produces fruit for the kingdom, the other one produces fruit not for the kingdom. Okay? And so this is when they can tell the difference. The fact that tares were so plentiful, though, throughout uh, the field, it made it very obvious that someone had sown uh, these, the, the tares, someone had sown them on purpose, and that they weren't actually there simply because of a random seed carried by the wind, or, or maybe the birds brought them over. Um, that, that's, it was very obvious that this was a deliberate act on the part of an enemy because of his hatred toward the owner. And so the roots of these plants, think about the roots, what happened to these roots. They would become so closely intertwined that it was very, very difficult to tell where one started and the other one ended. And so the servants, if you notice in that scripture we read, the servants, they said, well, Lord, do you want us to go and pull out the tares? We noticed that somebody, okay, so the enemy planted them. Do you want us to go pull them out? The servants wanted to pull the tares out of the ground because well, why? Because they steal nutrients. They're vulnerable to parasites. And the grain that comes from them, the tares, when they would reach maturity, the grain from the, the tares, they, were, they had a bitter taste to them. Uh, matter of fact, if you ate them, they would cause you to become dizzy and, and nauseous. And so the farmer, being wise, though, he doesn't allow the servants to pull up the tares. What had to be done was to wait until the harvest time. And then... They would separate them. They would store the wheat, and then they would take the tares, bundle them together, and they would burn them. And so there's something really interesting here that I also find about the wheat and, and the look-alike Darnell, how they grow. As these plants mature, as the wheat would mature, the stalks on the tares, they would grow. They would begin to get longer. Now, what happens with, with wheat, if you've seen wheat, when the grain begins to produce, the grain would begin to produce on the wheat stalk, what happens is the weight of the grain would make, make it bow. So the wheat would bow. But you know what's interesting about tares? Is that when they grew, they would grow straight up, nice and proud. And they would never bow. They never bowed. Right? The unsaved never bow to God. Christians, true Christians, they bow to the Lord. They surrender to the Lord. They worship the Lord. They bow. And so there's a big difference be between the two, but you don't see that. You don't see that until the fruit is being produced, until the grain is, is being produced. And so Jesus plants believers together in the world. He, he plants Christians together in the world. Why? For fellowship. Not to be by yourselves and be, be Lone Ranger Christians. He, he, he plants Christians together for discipleship, to grow together as iron sharpens iron, for ministry purposes, for growth, to bow together in, in worship uh, to the Lord. So the enemy, on the other hand, what does the enemy do? On the other hand, the enemy has people who look like believers, but they're not. And he plants them in the world right alongside the children of God. They appear to be Christians and I'll tell you right now, it gives the other people in the world something to look at, and, and they, they look at that and they say, they must be Christians, they look so much alike, and then true Christians get blamed for the things that the world does. And then people begin to blame God for what he supposedly is doing to them, because their representation are the tares, because they look so similar. What a picture we have of true believers and false believers in the world. And, and yes, it, it can happen even in the church. No doubt about it. The tares representing those who live by and every false religion, whether it be denying God, trying to be God, trying to get God, uh, to get to God through their own human efforts, you know, being, just being a really good person, maybe that way they'll get to God. And, and of course, we know Scripture doesn't teach any of that. And then, of course, we have the wheat that represents those who they know, they understand, they try to live by the truth that is only through Jesus Christ 
that a person can be saved from the just penalty of our sin, which is eternal separation from God. It's eternal torment. And so some would teach that this parable is specifically about believers and hypocrites within the church. Now, granted, both do exist, and the false followers of Christ, they can look very similar to true Christians in how they practice and in their words and in their activities. In many ways, it's actually very difficult to tell the difference between believers and non-believers until you start seeing the fruit. And, and according to Jesus' parable here, they're allowed to grow alongside of each other until the day of separation comes on that final day, the day of judgment. Now, thankfully, Jesus has been really clear for us in this parable as we have We've already seen in verse 38, the field is the world, okay? And, and what this tells us is that we aren't supposed to just completely separate ourselves and isolate ourselves from the world or unbelievers. We live in the world, and yet we shouldn't be of the world, but we're still in the world. Instead, what we're supposed to do is, as the church is in the world, next, right alongside of the unbeliever, the tares, we are supposed to live fully, completely devoted to Jesus Christ kind of lives, bearing the fullness of the fruit that he's given us to yield as we bow down and worship to him. And we let him do the separating and the punishing and the judging on that final day. But as Christians, we're here. But while we're here, what are we to do? We're to live our lives devoted to Jesus so that the world can see that, so that people can see the difference. We are supposed to be different. The church is absolutely supposed to look different than the world. We're not supposed to look the same. We're not supposed to act the same. We certainly shouldn't believe the same. Our responsibility as followers of Christ is to do what Jesus did, and that is to love people. It is to be kind having a servant's heart toward the people that God places in our lives where they have need, then we're supposed to step up to the plate and try and meet the need. Now, don't get me wrong, though, in, in this, where we are to be discerning. We're not just simply accepting people's sinful choices and, and saying that that is also okay. That is not what he's talking about here. Yet even in this, we are to do so in love. We don't know where that person stands in their relationship with God, or where they'll stand on the final day of the harvest. But listen, children of the kingdom or children of the evil one? I don't know. I wonder how many of us today, and I, I think this is where application comes into play, because I was studying this and I began to immediately do some self-reflecting. And I think we would all do good as a church to, to try and do this today. I wonder how many of us can look at even one moment in our lives this past week when we would have been ashamed to have our attitude or our words or our actions put on display for the world to see. How many of us would have been embarrassed to have a video of everything we said and did played in church this morning? What if I were to say, hey, by the way, so-and-so, I've got a video of you this week. <laughs> Everybody, let's sit back and enjoy. I would hope that most of you would sit back and go, you know what? Thank God I'm not the only one. How many of us behaved in a way that went against the fact that we are disciples of Jesus? How many believers do you think saw or heard us this past week and thought to themselves, ah, they can't be a Christian. There's no way. A Christian would never do that or say that or act like that. Now, I'll tell you, nobody wants to think about the results of the day of separation, that day of final judgment. But Jesus tells us in his own words, and it has a tendency to make people feel uncomfortable when they talk about it or when they think about it, but the fact that Jesus includes it and he teaches it so often so that, I think so that people would understand what it meant when he talked about what it would mean to anyone who would deny him. He tells us about it so that we won't deny him. 
He tells us, it's a warning. Jesus makes it really clear that this is something that we are to know, that we as the church are to understand, to discuss it, to teach it and preach about it. It is his truth to all of mankind. And, and we as true Christians are responsible. We're supposed to know and teach that truth. And I would say to deny the reality of the import, or the importance of this part of God's uh, teaching is essentially to deny the heart of the gospel message itself. Now you say, why do you say that? What is the gospel anyway? Well, this is something that every believer, every believer should know this. Every believer in Christ should know. I, I don't know what your understanding is of what makes up the gospel. I, I don't. Uh, I couldn't tell you, indiv every individual person here, where you're at in your understanding of this. But there are a handful of verses that I feel like we need to go over this morning as a church. Because I believe Christians today, the church, rather than being biblically illiterate about this, they need to know. We need to know. And I don't know where everyone's at. And so we're going to go over a few verses right now. Because I believe the wheat and the tares lead us right into, man, you need to know. You need to know and you need to be able to share what you know. And, and so this is kind of where we're at. A handful of verses that we need to know and be familiar with that we should be able to share with anyone that we come into contact with. If they wonder or they ask or you have an open door opportunity to share, you should be able to share these things with them in a couple of minutes. The first verse I think that we need to know is in Romans chapter 3 verse 23. I want you to take a look at that with me. <clears throat> he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every single one of us. That's the world. That's all of mankind. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every person who is of age and intelligence and their understanding right from wrong, who has ever lived and is living now, they've made a conscious and willful choice to do wrong at some point. They have sinned. Those moral laws that we have broken are God's, they are his eternal laws. You aren't getting around it. Nobody is getting around it. It doesn't matter if you think it's right or wrong, okay? It is God's moral law, and it is his standard. Not your standard, not my standard, not a, the standard of our country, even our Supreme Court justices, and the law that is handed down from our court system, if it goes against God's standard, it's wrong. And so it's God's law and those moral laws that we have, we have broken his eternal laws. That is what we call sin. It is disobedience of the laws of God. And it only takes one. One law. One broken law. One sin of disobedience. So the result of our sin then is actually explained to us in the next verse that we need to know. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. You've heard me quote this very often. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The result of our choice to sin results in eternal separation from God. That is, that word for death, that is spiritual death, my friends. That's spiritual death. Okay? But thank God he's provided the free gift of eternal life through Christ. Amen? So we see both right there, the wages of sin, separation from God. But God has given us the free gift of eternal life through Jesus. So we praise him for that. Now I want you to read this in Isaiah 59 and 2. It says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now there's only one way to bridge that eternal gap between God and us, his creation, and to avoid that eternal punishment meant for all of those who reject his gift of salvation. And that is faith in Jesus Christ alone. No, it's not all religions lead to the same place. It's not everyone's going to get there on their own path. That is not what the Bible teaches. There are other scriptures, and I won't give you the reference, but it says that there is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus himself, unless he's a liar, he himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. Okay, he's referencing himself only through Jesus Christ. There is one way 
And I love that. God made it so simple. There's just one way. There's only one choice. You don't have to worry about all the other stuff. There's one way. God made it very easy. Let's read this next. The key verse here. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. He demonstrated his love toward us. He showed his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, of course, John 3.16, uh, you could jot down 1 Peter 3 and 18. You can jot down 1 Timothy uh, 2 and 5. You, you can write those down. These are key verses to know, to understand, to be able to relate to another person. Um, we need to understand that there is a very real, severe penalty for being an unredeemed sinner. The world needs to know that. Christians, we know that. We need to take it seriously about those that are lost, those that God puts in our lives. There's a very real penalty for being an unredeemed sinner, and they need to know that, it, listen, that is what they will face if they reject Christ. How is a person to understand and accept that fact that they need a Savior or that they need to be saved if they don't know what they need to be saved from? And so we have our problem we have God's solution to it. So what does the person's response need to be? Maybe you're here today, and you don't know Christ. And we're reading this together, and you're going, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, wow. You know what? Maybe God's speaking to you right now. So what is our response? What should it be? John 1 and 12. Let's read this together. But as many as received him, Jesus... To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Romans 10 and 9 says this, If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is our response. That's what your response should be. And I will tell you this morning that there is absolutely no such thing as a closet Christian. Everything in our lives as followers of Christ is to make it obvious that we belong to him. Beginning with a public confession that we have, been, we have given ourselves to him and that we've been accepted by him as our Savior. We've accepted him as our, our Savior and our Lord. It's a public confession. That's what baptism is. It's a public confession, an outward symbolic symbol of what has happened inside. And so I say to you, tell the people that you know what you've done. I don't care if it was 30 years ago that you got saved. You need to be telling people what you did. You need to be telling people that you've accepted Christ. You need to share with them what, they've done, what he's done in your heart and in your life. Share with people what he's done. Make it a public confession that we've given ourselves to him. We've, we've accepted him. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 10. Verse 32 to 33. Oh, it's not switching over. Let's see if we can get it switched over for you. There we go. It says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Let's read the next part of it. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Don't reject Christ. Accept him. Believe in him. Ask him to come into your heart by faith. Ask him to reveal himself to you. Thank him for the gift of eternal life that he's given to you. Ask him to help you live your life in a way that honors him and brings glory to him. Church, let me, ju let me just close by 
Let me just close by asking a few questions. Some questions I, I started to ask myself as I was coming to an end of my study. Who should we be praying for? Who do you need to be praying for right now? Who should you be accepting in a Christ-like loving way and and just allowing your life to be something that God will use to draw them to himself? What changes do you need to make to allow that to happen? Who are you being critical of and judgmental toward who just need, they just need a hand of, uh, of mercy and grace extended to them to give them a little bit of hope? Not just now, but for eternity. It's not our job to condemn people to hell. As the church, it's our responsibility to share the love of Christ and the message of Christ, the message of hope, hoping that they would receive that message. Our job is to plant seeds. Not to be judgmental, not to walk around this world acting like we're God or that we're the Holy Spirit. We allow Him to do those things. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit would shine a spotlight on all of our hearts and show us where and how we need to be changed. And I know that I have praying to do of my own. But what about you today? Where do you stand? Will you gather or will you scatter? Let's pray this morning. Father, this morning we come to you having received your word this morning. I just pray that the seed of your word and your truth would find a heart, a soil that is good and rich and ready to receive your word, allowing it to grow each and every day as we follow you and we Apply your truth to our heart and our life. Father, I pray that your church would not be the kind of church that is in the business of condemning all those that don't look like us, but actually have some of the same sins that we ourselves have. Father, I pray that the church would repent of their sin first. And then come alongside those in the world and live our lives devoted and committed to your son Jesus. Helping those that we're living our lives alongside of, helping those to also see and realize their need to be saved just like we did. Help us to help them see their need for salvation the need to be saved from the consequences of sin that is eternal separation from you. Father, I just pray that you would help the church to put on your eyes and to truly see people the way that you see them, your creation that you love, that you desire none should perish but all have everlasting life. Help us to see them that way and understand and realize that if the world hates us, it's because they hated your son first. The enemy is sin. The enemy is not my neighbor. The enemy is sin. The enemy is the devil sowing the wicked seed Father, I pray that you'd help the church to stand boldly in this world as we follow your son. But if there's anything here today that your church needs to repent of, first and foremost, again, I ask that you'd help us to do business with you right now. 
with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Maybe there are those that are here today who have never placed their hope and their faith in Christ as their Lord and Savior. I want to give you the opportunity to do that. I'm not going to ask you to necessarily come forward, but I, I would ask you, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you feel the need to be forgiven of your sin and to ask Christ into your heart and life, to surrender your heart to Him, surrender your life to Him for the first time, I'm just going to ask you real quick before I, I lead you in a prayer of salvation, if you would just quickly raise your hand and put it right back down. All you're doing is simply saying, Pastor Larry, would you pray for me? I want to know Jesus this morning. How many would raise their hands this morning? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? If you've raised your hand this morning... Those of you that are here, listen, just continue to pray. Do battle right now, all right, on their behalf. If you've, if you've raised your hand today, you want to accept Christ, I want you to, I'm going to lead you in a prayer that I prayed to God and I accepted him into my heart and my life and surrendered to him. All you have to do is mean it. Just mean it from your heart as you talk to God. I promise you he's listening to you right now. Just simply say words to him like this. Just talk to him and say, God, I know that I have sinned against you. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've done wrong. But I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. And I ask right now that you would forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my unrighteousness. Cleanse me of my sin. And I pray that as I repent, I'm turning away from my old life right now. I want to put off my old life, and I want to put on your son Christ. And I want to live for him and live for you this day forward. Give me your Holy Spirit to help me to do that. And I thank you for saving me this morning. Now listen, if you said that prayer this morning, the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one person who gets saved. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you this morning. We thank you for this time. I praise you for those that have raised their hands for salvation. I pray that you continue to do a work in their heart. Help them to share that message, to share what they've done with someone. Father, I'd love to hear that from them this morning even. And I just praise you and thank you for your son Christ and what he's done for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Come, you weary heart, now to Jesus. Come, you anxious soul, now and see. There is perfect love and comfort in your tears. Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the good. The goodness of Jesus satisfied me is all that I need. May it become one day that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. This world cannot offer. Come and find your joy here complete. Taste the living water, never thirst again. Rest here in his wondrous peace. For oh, the goodness, the goodness of
all he said he would be. Grace is overflowing from the Savior's heart. Rest here in his wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. Satisfied, he is all that I need. May it become one day that I rest on. Father God, it is so good to be in your house to worship. We pray that as we go from this place today, that you would just anoint us, empower us to be the hands and the feet, uh, to just witness to those around us and see souls saved. It is in the glory of God, the glory of Jesus Christ, the gift that he gave us, the goodness of him coming to this earth to offer himself as that sacrifice, that we are able to worship you and claim eternity with you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray today. And amen. Have a wonderful and blessed week this week.